we'll start in on number one. Again, interrupt me when you got questions. So when you get to these free response problems, we really want to start thinking about critical reading skills and identifying things that are important as we read through the paragraph. So you got blocks one and two placed on a horizontal surface um, at these locations. The surface is frictionless except for point C and D. So that's an important thing to start off with that um, there, you know, except for this little space right here, uh, everything else is frictionless. So there's friction here, but nowhere else. Uh, then, uh, beginning at time, TA block one is pushed with constant horizontal force. Again, that's another important idea. So uh, the word constant there means if it's constant force, okay, just kind of off to the side, constant force. Actually, let's write it right next to this. If this has constant force, that should produce constant acceleration. And the reason that's important is we're gonna have to graph this stuff pretty soon. And knowing that it's at constant acceleration is gonna help us. Um, all right, uh, next. So we keep reading and eventually gets to this point where it says block at part B, it loses contact. So that force that was on there is gonna stop right at this point here. So force stops here. And if the force stops, then the acceleration stops. And if your acceleration stops, you should be going at a constant velocity uh, until something else happens on that system. Now it gets a little tricky. It says block one collides with and sticks to block two <clears throat> at this point here. And then they want to know after which the two block system continues moving across the surface. So the system is the two blocks, not just the single one on its own. And that can trip you up when you get down to the graph because what they want us to graph is what the speed of the center of mass would be. And so the center of mass is something that, um, you know, it only changes if there's an external force on that system. So think about our system. If our system is the two blocks, uh, I should have visual aids. Okay, two blocks, what do I have with me? Coffee and a deck of cards. Okay, if the, if the system is just these two, then any forces coming outside of these two objects would change the motion of the center of mass of the system. So if you start thinking through the scenario, what were things that were external? There was a spring shoving one of the blocks, actually shove it this way. So there was a spring pushing and shoving that block, that's external. So during that time, the center of mass, um, will change, the speed will change. And then the only other time that there is um, external forces is during the friction section when the surface is rubbing across this block, slowing it down. So apart from that, there should be no other changes in our speed and whatever speed we're going, it should be a constant velocity. So object in motion stays in motion. That seems weird because when they collide, we're gonna, want, we kind of see it going slower and so our tendency on this graph is we're going to think of like, oh, at time E when they collide, we want to draw this like drop in velocity in, or in speed. But we can't do that because that is an internal force. The center of mass actually is not affected during that collision. So uh, it's hard to like animate what this would be like, but um, you'd have the center of mass of the system probably starting off somewhere like between these two, and then it would accelerate right it get faster and faster and faster as block b moved so we get closer and closer to here and then it would be drifting at a constant speed and then block one would finally get to block c so this would slow down and then they would drift at a steady speed together and then right at this moment here they would be colliding connect and then drift off at an even slower speed so um i know it's hard to visualize but that is um that's how that is working. I did have, let me see if this works. Um, give me feedback on this part. I'm gonna switch to a YouTube video to kind of show what that idea is like. And I don't know how this is gonna play through um, this, this screen sharing. I don't think the audio is gonna come through, but let me just, I don't know, give me feedback after I try this. So if I switch over 
to this video here. He's going to show this idea how the center of mass doesn't change even if there's like a collision or an interaction between the two surfaces. So let's just play this video. So that little dot, actually I could just narrate it. I don't think the audio is going to come through, but that little dot is at the dead center of mass of those two objects, and it'll always remain there. They're going through some complicated motion of oscillating back and forth, but that center of mass, if you watch, just kind of drifts at a steady speed across the track. And so the internal collision of those two objects actually doesn't change where the center of mass is located. They can move and oscillate off of each other, or in our scenario, they could collide together, and that still doesn't change it. Now, I know this is kind of lagging. I can see up on the screen, it's it's kind of catching and jumping. Um, but give me feedback on if, if I cut to a video like this, are you able to see it first? Um, I mean, is it, is it lagging so much that you, you can't even see what's going on? Or um, I guess also, is it, does it make sense to, to view it this way without sound as long as I'm narrating? Um, I just kind of like that feedback when you're, um, if you're able to send it through the chat. So what he's going to do now is he actually turns off the lights to show that center of mass just drifting at a steady speed so that our eyes don't pick up on the movement of the individual objects. And Thank you, Lucas. It's lagging, but viewable. Okay. So um, the UV light picks up on that little red dot and that center of mass. And as he drifts this across, that's just going at a steady speed across the track. So those things are shaking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth right now. But without being able to see that, it just looks like the dot is um, going steady across there. So um Okay, so I'm getting some feedback from you guys. Thank you. It looks like it's it's lagging, but um, at least provides a visual for you to see that happen. Um, if you wanted to see that um, idea, you could watch that full lecture from Walter Lewin, but I'm going to go back to our problem. Okay, so now it's time to start graphing. On the axis below, sketch the speed of the center of mass of the two-block system as a function of time. So our center of mass is going to start at rest. Okay, the two blocks were not moving to begin with. And then uh, it's going to pick up speed in that first section. And it doesn't really matter where you draw this line to because it's not quantitative. Um, you just have to show the concept that it's speeding up. And the reason that I know it's like this and not, uh, let me just draw some other trajectory. Maybe it's like fast at first and then it tapers off or something like that. Um, the reason I know it's not these two is because it was a constant speed and a con or sorry, a constant force. And if it's a constant force, we should have a constant acceleration. And so the slope should be constant. And just as a reminder, uh, the slope would be the acceleration. That would be the change in velocity over change in time. And the reason that's constant is because net force equals MA. If you have a constant force on that mass, you should have constant acceleration. So we get a, a constant slope for that first section. Then the spring stops touching it. So it's going to drift at a steady velocity. The center of mass is going to drift. And um, I mean, the block and the center of mass technically have a constant velocity. But what we're really graphing is the, is the center of mass of the system's speed, not just that one block. Uh, and then you get to section C and D. And at this point, this is where the friction happened. And so we need to show it slowing down. Oops, erased. We need to show it slowing down for this section. Okay. And then it gets past that and drifts at a steady speed. And I'm going to stop it here because it's going to collide here. And when I first was graphing this, my idea was like, oh, or my thought, my first thought was, well, it's going to slow down because I was only thinking of that first block. Yes, that block here will slow down when it smacks into E, and E will speed up. But E speeding up and A slowing down, or let's say block one slowing down and block two speeding up, that effect is canceled. 
And so if we're drawing the center of mass, that is an internal force between those. The center of mass doesn't actually change what it's doing throughout that whole section. So this should actually just be a steady, constant line. And that is how uh, we'd have to graph that function. All right, on to part B. The plunger is returned to its original position. Uh, both blocks are removed, a uniform solid sphere. Okay, so now we are probably getting into rotation. Anytime they put a wheel or a sphere in the problem, it's something where we have to um, worry about rotational motion at the same time. And um, it says the sphere is pushed by the plunger from point A to point B. So it's getting shoved here. Um, it loses contact. So this is really all the same setup. And then it, um, and it moves across the horizontal toward point E. All right. At which intervals, if any, does the sphere's angular momentum about its center of mass change? So keep in mind, angular momentum is that rotational quantity, L equals I times omega. And the I value of this thing is going to stay the same. So this is not going to change because it's always going to stay this little sphere here. That, that's not going to change. What is going to change, let me just animate this out here. What is going to change is as this um, gets to, so it's going to just be shoved across here. By the time it gets to here, uh, can I rotate this? No. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, I can't rotate it, but if I could show that thing spinning right now, once it hits the um, this section of friction, the friction is going to push against it and provide a torque, and it's going to start spinning the object up, and that's actually going to increase the angular velocity. What a lot of people get wrong in this problem is they assume it to start spinning fast here, like the plunger spins it and makes it spin uh, faster and faster, and then it's going to like slow down in this section. And that's not true, actually. It has zero, it has zero um, spin because there's no friction in this first section. Think about it like skidding across the surface. There's nothing to grip that wheel and, or that sphere and start rotating it. So um, there actually is no spin until you get to section C. So the only points that you are spinning and changing your omega, because if this goes up, then this has to go up, your angular momentum has to go up, would be from C to D. There's In all the other places, there's no external torques. Even that thing, that plunger pushing on it, isn't shoving at, like on the top or bottom, it's just shoving it equally. Um, and we're getting a question, and let me back up. Yes, the friction does make it spin faster because it's actually not spinning at all. If I could show you, um, just while we're going through this, it looks like Alexandra's saying, since they don't define the system, could you say the angular momentum doesn't change? No, because they did um, They did talk about the sphere's angular momentum. So um, they're, because they want, they specifically said the sphere's angular momentum, Alexandra, we do have to, um, incorporate that, or we have to account for that. So, all right, let me show you what I was trying to talk about with the golf ball. So, um, getting some more questions. So the plunger is not external, but doesn't change angle momentum because it doesn't make it spin. Correct. Isaac is asking if um, the external force, that causes a change in linear momentum, but it doesn't cause any change in angular momentum because it doesn't start it spinning. Remember, the only way to change angular momentum is to have your, uh, your, um, sorry, your rotational velocity increase. Um, because with that single sphere being our system, this shape is never going to change. So one more time, that plunger is going to, let me just have a logo here so you can see, uh, sorry, there's a thing in the way. Um, as you shove this, the plunger is going to shove this across frictionless surface all the way to point C. And so it's just going to be sliding, sliding, sliding until you get to point C. And then it's going to start gripping the surface. And you see now it's going to start rotating. So that same I value, whenever the sphere's I value, is now going to start rotational motion. And that is going to cause an increase in angular momentum through sections C and D. Once it gets past C and D, 
then that angular momentum, whatever it was spinning at, that's just going to maintain and it's going to keep spinning at that rate forever and ever because um, there's no there's no external torques trying to make it spin any faster. So I hope that helps or you're able to to do that um, that type of problem. Um, let me I get some still recording here. I'm gonna close out of my phone and just try meet again real quick and then I'll keep going in the problem. So do, 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 do. I open up Google Meet again and join this live stream. I'm gonna try to project that camera one more time. All right, now hopefully you see another view, but it may not be working again. Oh, well, I'll just move on. Okay, because we at least got one camera working. Next, um, on number two, oh, let's look at the rubric for that. Um, sorry, this was the um, briefly explain your reasoning. If you take a look at the rubric, on that problem, this is how they broke down the points. So if you, you got one point for reasoning that a change in angular momentum is caused by net external torque. So you had to kind of talk about what would cause the angular momentum to change. And then for correctly indicating that friction from C to D is the only force producing external torque. Um, down here, if you read this, they do it in a claim evidence and reasoning style. And so you can see that method of, of trying to explain it. That is another way of doing that problem. Um, but you're not required to do it that way. That's just uh, what there's many like it's called NGSS standards. A lot of um, science standards have switched to making that claim evidence and reasoning as part of their as part of their uh, way of answering all science questions. So under the shadows. Okay, sorry, that's probably really loud because I was banging the mic around, but um, I'll keep this video feed going. All right, next. Doo, doo, doo. Um, when you do the, the Atwood machine problem, I think we did this one actually in class. And when I was starting to solve this out, it seemed very familiar. And so um, I believe that we did this like in review for the final, or maybe we did it when we did these, um, when we did these types of Atwood machine problems. But um, yeah, I will I will kind of go through this one again, and it may seem familiar to you, but we'll work out how to solve this one. Um, Yasin is asking what direction is the friction, and in that case, Yasin, let me scroll back up. So he's wondering like which way would the friction point on this wheel? And so technically the friction would shove back here to start this thing spinning faster and faster. The torque would be in a direction to make it start um, spinning. Uh, what would that be? Uh, clockwise or yeah, clockwise. So um, friction would be backwards on it, and that would make it spin clockwise. All right, on to the Atwood machine. This problem explores how the relative masses of two blocks affect the acceleration. In this problem, um, you first have to answer conceptual questions. And so um, if block A was super big, like much greater than block B, then block A up on that table would be so large that block B just would not be able to move it. And so um, even if there's no friction, your if your mass, even if this, let's say this force here, um, this force of gravity acting on this, that is going to be the net external pulling force on this whole system. And so if this is my system, I'm going to highlight my system. It's going to be this block and this little block down here. As that is my system, and we play with the numbers here, 
if your mass goes to infinity, for F equals MA, right? If mass goes to infinity, acceleration is going to go to zero. Yeah, given a, a steady amount of net force. Your mass gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your acceleration is going to basically become zero. So that little block is not going to be able to pull that amount of mass um, quickly, and so the acceleration would go to zero. Ooh, GM told what to make. Trump invokes the defense. Oh, it's gone. I got to turn off my notifications, I realize, because they keep popping in on my iPad. So um, next, if it was really small, okay, if we then ignore this, then it would be like block B is just in free fall. So in part two, in part two, you're going to be basically in free fall. And block B would just be pulled on by gravity. And so A would equal G. And this one, A would equal zero or close to zero. And they give you points on the rubric. Um, no matter if you say like exactly zero or close to zero. So if you said A equals G or 9.8 meters per second squared, that would be part two. Briefly explain the reason for that is that your acceleration is going to be equal to just that single mass um, or sorry, your acceleration is going to be the force divided by that mass. And so just the force of gravity divided by that mass would equal 9.8. All right. When you get on to part B, it's about drawing free body diagrams. And block, yikes, block A on the table um, has a weight. It's called MAG and a normal force. And then it's got this tension pulling to the right. Block B, on the other hand, has a weight, MBG, and tension pulling up. It doesn't, you don't have to draw the exact uh, sizes of these arrows to get full credit, um, as long as you have a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. So this is a free body diagram, and um, you didn't have to make them quantitative. Um, things that I saw that they took points off of, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, is if you labeled this like MG also, because you're like, oh, uh, maybe it's the same amount of, of strength or something, um, you do want to label that tension. So um, they don't have to be equal to each other. Tension, if this was accelerating, then tension would be less than the weight. If this was... Um, going at a constant velocity, then tension would equal the weight. So there's a couple different scenarios that we could have for how these free body diagrams would look. Then um, they want you to derive an equation for the acceleration. This one I know we did uh, either in class or I'm gonna have to pull up a, a different file here to get some workspace to write this out. But um, if you're gonna do an equation for that, you wanna treat it as a system. So the acceleration of your system would equal the net force on the system divided by the mass of the system. And remember, the net force is going to come from the only force acting on that system is this guy right here. Um, everything else is internal. The tension is inside the system. The normal force that's pushing is, is not uh, increasing or decreasing the uh, acceleration at all. It's just supporting block A. So there's no other forces in this problem that would be external. If this had friction on the tabletop, then that would be an external force. But because it's a frictionless table, then we don't have to worry about that. So I'll just maybe leave this image up as we keep going through this. So I would say that the net force, uh, oops, net force is um, block, it'd be the force of gravity of block B. But as the problem states, I can only use their variables. So let's read through what I can use, MA, MB, and any physical constants. So I can't just write the force of gravity. That would not count. Instead, I'd have to use this as mass of block B times G. That would satisfy the net force requirement, divided by the mass of the system, which would just be MA plus MB. So that is how we would get the acceleration of our system. And it would just be the external net force divided by the total mass. If there was friction, um, then we would 
take the pulling force down minus the frictional force backwards. All right, let's minimize that. And um, part D, consider their scenario from part A, where the mass of block A is much less than the mass of block B. Does your equation for the acceleration of the blocks agree? Well, yes, if you're, um, if, let's see, where mass of A is much less. So if you have mass of A much less than mass of B, let's, let's basically call it zero. Think about what you have in this equation. You're gonna have mass of B divided by mass of B plus, and this will just become zero. And so really your acceleration would just be 9.8. And so in that one, uh, you can just describe that it is gonna equal out. And, and the reasoning is because as mass of A approaches zero, you have the same mass divided by itself times gravity, and therefore the acceleration of your system would be very close to gravity. Um, dun, 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 briefly explain your reasoning uh, when mass A is, okay, now part E. While the blocks are accelerating, the tension of the vertical position is replaced by uh, a pulley of negligible mass is, oh, it's replaced with a pulley that has mass. Uh, when the blocks are accelerating this scenario, how is the tension compared? Okay, so here's what the, a quick way of getting to this one. That pulley, it, it's gonna take torque to spin it, okay? And so that's gonna be harder to move than a pulley that would just spin freely. And so the think about where that torque is gonna be coming from, right? Let me draw up a little picture here. If this is our pulley and you got the string wrapped around here, um, kind of tugging on this, let's just say with a force that direction at the single point here, the, the, the grip um, of the string rubbing into the wheel would be pulling it. That is gonna cause, um, that's gonna cause an increase in resistance of our overall system. And so it's gonna be harder to make that thing rotate and our acceleration should be less because it's now harder to move all of these objects. Really think about it like it just become you put in another object that has to move and get turning. And so our acceleration is gonna be less in that second scenario. And the reason our acceleration is less is because the tension increased. So let's just imagine that free body diagram for that block hanging this is mass of block B, it had a certain weight on there. Let's say in the first scenario, it had tension T1. Well, now that you're having to cause additional force to get that thing to spin, your tension getting bigger, right, is gonna have now less force, less net force, on block B, so there'd be less acceleration and the reason that happens is because how how your free body diagram works so there's a couple of ways of like getting yourself like to briefly explain your rationale there where you could say um, the overall system is going to be slower to move it's going to have a smaller acceleration because now you have an additional component that has to get turning and that takes um, some of the energy away and then you can go off of that and say in order to accelerate less then you'd have to have more tension in this diagram. You see off to the side, there have to be more tension in this diagram up than there was in the first place in order to have the net force being reduced, causing the acceleration to be lower. The rubric for that one, let's kind of scroll down here. Do, do, do. Where is it? So um, you got a point for saying that the um, acceleration should be less. And then a second point, if you've backed it up with some conclusive evidence that, um, and they have like three examples of what you could do there. So that is all for um, uh, homework. I'll post this later, but homework is gonna be Dun, dun, dun. If AP for your cloud. Okay, I would like you to work through this problem for Monday. 
So that spring problem, um, I want you to work through that. I'm probably just going to post a video solution to it. And um, that's it. So I, I don't think I'll do another live stream for this one problem. I'll probably just have a video solution made up. But um, give me feedback in the form about what we can do. And I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.